Welcome, everyone. If correspond banking is not the future, what is? That's what we'll be discussing uh, in a moment. I'm Stefan Dab. I'm the global head of BCG uh, Payments and Transaction Banking Practice. And it's a pleasure and a honor to me, uh, for me today to uh, facilitate uh, quite a flagship panel with uh, very strong uh, panelists. So let me introduce them, and then we'll, uh, we'll start in the discussion. <coughs> so that was myself. We don't need this. Next slide. OK. Javier Orejas, who is uh, head of banking, uh, EMEA, and Americas at Chata, which uh, you will see in a moment. He'll uh, introduce himself. He's processing quite more transactions than what, that what we may think. To his left, we have Christian Westerhaus from Deutsche Bank, who is the head of clearing products. And clearing is obviously a quite central theme in correspondent banking. To his left, we have uh, Emma Loftus from JP Morgan, who is head of global payments of ethics. And finally, we have Nigel Dobson uh, from ANZ, who is general manager, wholesale digital transformation. Let me start by uh, setting the stage before we uh, enter into uh, a discussion. It's going to be an interactive discussion among panelists and also with the audience. But let me give you just a little bit of, of, of data and, and context. <coughs> so if we look at, at the world today, if we look at uh, uh, cross-border uh, payments, uh, there are a few structural trends uh, that are there, that are driving cross-border payments, and that are not new. They're here to stay, but they're still driving the landscape to a large extent. Uh, the first trend is obviously the electronification of payment. It is more of a domestic trend. Uh, but just if you look at the number today, if you take Sweden today, the cash transaction account for no more than 10% of all transactions in value, just to give you the extent to which cash uh, uh, payment electronification has gone. For the first year in 2017, the first year in history, where card transactions have surpassed cash transactions globally, with 23 trillion uh, transactions. It's more domestic, but it's just to show you the extent to which we go to an electronic world. So if you look at globalization uh, of, of trade and the financial flows, obviously there are questions around uh, more nationalisms. Uh, there are questions around globalization. But when you look at the data, the reality is that trade is still growing. If you, if you uh, have a quick look at the corridors, the north-north corridor are accounting, are, are growing at 2-3%. So it's not huge, but it's still growing. If you look at the south co south corridor, they're growing at 8-9%. Uh, and net-net, we see global uh, trade in our, I would say, base case scenario, in our pessimistic scenario, trade is still growing at 4.3%. It's expected to grow at 4.3%. If you look at trade services, it's expected to grow at 4.8%. So there is still growth uh, in trade, and, and globalization is, is here to stay. Interestingly, when you look at the right side of the slide, if you look at where the transactions are cleared, you see that most of the transactions, even the south-south transactions, are still cleared, uh, I would say, in the north of the planet, uh, and notably in the US. So I think it's a quite interesting contrast between the trends on trade and where payments are clear, cleared. And I'm sure that we're, we're discussing a bit about this when we we'll talk about the future of, uh, of trade. Finally, obviously, and unfortunately, uh, the world continues to be very complex uh, with uh, many regulatory interventions, and that's also here to stay. So there are, there are a few things we've been living with the last few years uh, that are there and that, 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 are, that will continue to be there. Let's have a quick look at what is changing. There are basically uh, four or five things that are very structurally changing. Don't think it's completely new, but it's, it, it's good to keep them in, uh, just to, to, to keep them in mind when you have the discussion. One is obviously the digitization of interface that has nothing to do with, uh, I would say, with payment at a start, but we have a new generation of corporate treasurer. Uh, they go to Amazon, they're used to buying something in a second, they're used to, being, to have, having their product being delivered the next day in a very <coughs> simple, intuitive manner, and that is changing quite a bit the way, uh, obviously, 
your clients, our clients are uh, having expectations around their interfaces. And we think this is very, very structural. Uh, the second thing which is uh, quite uh, structural is the rise of global marketplace. And you can say, why is this structural for, uh, for international payment? Actually, we see that some domestic transactions are becoming cross-border transactions just because people shop in marketplace. So some you go to, to Uber, it's obviously a very domestic service. The payment may be a cross-border payments because there is a different where, where Uber is located and how they process payments and how they pay their drivers. And it's the same when people go Amazon or where they go on uh, Airbnb. Uh, interestingly, and that's a recent work we've done with Swift, we see quite strong growth on the Swift network on the small, on the small transactions. Uh, transactions under $500 uh, dollars are growing at 20%, so much faster than uh, large transactions, and that's largely explained also by change uh, in, in, uh, in purchasing patterns. And, and obviously, uh, when we look at um, data storage and processing, when we look at the development of APIs, uh, this is creating new opportunities to bring value-added services to clients in the way they interact. It's also changing their expectations in terms of having more of an open banking environment. And so the, these are the changes uh, we're dealing with. And if you go back a bit now to, to international payment and you think through how these trends, both what is there uh, and what is changing, if we look at how they're going to reshape the, the payments environment, there, there are four or five key things. Uh, the first one is that uh, the, the, the payment value chain is, is becoming very fragmented. There is no convergence, uh, uh, notably in the in the, the consumer world, there were big expectations about wallets and everybody going to a you know, an ubiquitous wallet that you would use online, in-app, at point of sales. We don't see that. We see fragmentation. Uh, in the corporate world, it's very structuring because in the past, we used to have layers uh, of infrastructure and we used to have competition within these layers, increasing what we see is competition within a vertical and players owning a piece of the value chain end-to-end, -end, and delivering services end-to-end. -end. And it, this is uh, changing very significantly the, the nature of the competition, especially when you look at the way the, the data uh, is now, um, the payment is becoming an invisible part of business processes with much, much richer data. And that is changing things very structurally. If you look uh, at a player like, if you look at e-commerce today, you see that it's global firms like Adyen, like WorldPay, Vantif, like Ingenico, who are now owning these verticals. I think traditional banks have, to a large extent, uh, exited the global uh, acquiring markets in e-commerce. And that's a, a typical example of competition that starts to be end-to-end -end in a digital way within a vertical. The, the second... Uh, 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 Obvious the second development that I don't need to, to talk too much about because it's very obvious, it's around the correspondent banking landscape. We'll discuss that in a moment. We obviously see bank retreating from high risk, low volume, uh, low volume uh, markets, with the consequence that now some, uh, some new entrants that are uh, less regulated are uh, uh, taking, taking some space. It would be interesting to have a discussion with the regulator while they actually uh, promote uh, some probably less compliant players. The third one is also quite important. In the world that is becoming digital, what we see is that there are new client segments that were protected, notably the SME, that are much less protected because the SME was very difficult for a bank. You, you need it, obviously, to have local and domestic coverage to serve SME. In a world that is becoming digital, it is much less the case, and that means that specialized players like TransferWise, or again, players like Adyen can digitally serve uh, clients that were more difficult to, to target. And I think that's also something that is quite, that is quite uh, fundamental. Uh, and finally, maybe a quick word on infrastructure. Uh, on infrastructure, we see clearly the modernization of infrastructure on one hand, and that's what we'll discuss in a moment, modernization of existing infrastructure, Globally, obviously, with infrastructure like Swift modernizing uh, the way it's processing message with uh, GPI, which we'll discuss in a moment. More domestically and increasingly also uh, cross-border 
uh, faster payment. So, so there is definitely a movement on the modernization of, infra of existing infrastructure. And at the same time, we obviously see competing infrastructure emerging. And that is, that's the landscape. And that's the new landscape uh, for cross-border payments. So let's go now to what that means. And let's have a discussion around, OK, in this new environment, which is digital, where there is still growth, where there is new vertical competition, what's the future for correspondent banking? So let me, let me kick off the discussion. We'll try to make it uh, uh, lively. We'll open it up for questions. Let, let me start with Javier, because Javier is a user. Uh, he's working for Yata. And I'd like to first have a view of a user of the banking system around the need that we still need to resolve. What are the pain points that we need to have in mind when we think about the future of correspondent banking? So, so Javier, you may want to see a world. Yata is a quite specific association, but you, again, you process a lot of payments, so you should have a view around yeah. the pain points. Ayata is, is uh, as I usually say, is an strange animal. Ayata is, uh, before addressing your question, is the International Transport Association. Our main objective is basically to serve, uh, air, lead, and, and represent the airline industry. Um, our members are around 260, which represents around the 86, 87% of the global air traffic. <coughs> and from Ayata, we are providing some kind of financial services to the, to the airlines. Last year, we processed through our systems 360 billion USD, uh, European USD, which is a huge amount of money. And we are providing these services in more than 160 countries worldwide. So obviously, from IATA, we are processing many, uh, not only domestic, but uh, international transactions. Uh, and I would say that uh, from a corporate perspective, um, the main pain points, first of all, I will start with transparency. Transparency is impacting in two, in two key important things. First of all is speed. Uh, usually you know, or timing, uh, you know at the time that uh, the transaction is executed because obviously you are clicking the button, but especially in international payments, you don't know, you don't have clarity when these funds will arrive. And keep in mind that that is important because in all services or where you are selling whatever, uh, the moment of the truth is the moment where uh, these funds or the payment is done. Then transparency is impacting the cost. Uh, there are some, unfortunately, some situations in which you are transferring some amounts, or uh, and unfortunately, in the recipient, uh, they are receiving a completely different amount. So there are some discrepancies which trigger some kind of investigations. Then another important uh, point, uh, which I believe is the, the one of the hot topics, is uh, security and everything around security, uh, the data protection, cybersecurity, uh, AML mm -hmm. compliance I put in the same basket. Uh, and finally, uh, something that we cannot underestimate uh, is standards. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the regulators, something that they, they should, um, is, and in the same way as Ayata, we are, we, are, uh, we are playing an important role in order just to develop standards. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that instead of going in the right direction, there are some situations in which we are going in the opposite direction, creating uh, some kind of country specifics. And that makes for the corporates the, the life really difficult. Very good. I don't know. It, it, it's quite interesting. Maybe, maybe we'll have a discussion, but maybe we should go immediately to, to, to question two, because and then we'll open a discussion. Because I think it, it's quite interesting. You talk about transparency. Yeah. That was you, 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 your very first point. Uh, and maybe, Emma, you've been quite involved also in, uh, you know, as an important bank in you know, the development around GPI. And I'd like to, to have a question with you and then really discuss with the panel. To which extent are we fixing this pain point to, yeah. to GPI? Not around transparency, but you also mentioned different thing, which is AML and standards, uh, which goes a bit beyond uh, I GPI. I mentioned many mm -hmm. things, yeah. yeah. So I think the, the question is, has it, does it fix the existing pain points? I think it starts to address. So one of mm -hmm. the biggest criticisms um, for how we process cross-border payments today are they're slow, expensive, and they're not transparent. And um, I think when we think about what GPI is starting to do, it's creating the connectivity across the banks so that we can start to address those pain points. So what do you get immediately? Transparency. So can you do a track and trace 
all the way to the end beneficiary, not yet, mm -hmm. because we need GPI to be adopted globally and we want as many participants on the ecosystem as we possibly can. But the intention there is so that we can achieve full visibility for our clients end to end. So that will address one pain point. Um, the expense factor, I think, will be a reveal. GPI itself won't address those issues, but at least it won't be a mystery about how we deliver funds to the end beneficiary. Um, but then I think what we need to focus on is what do we do next? So we're trying to get as many banks into the ecosystem as we possibly can. We're introducing new standards. I know in the US, the Clearinghouse and the Fed will be carrying the transaction reference come November, so that will help the intermediary banks carry the tracking references across, um, at least for US dollar. But we need more participants and we need to widen um, that net so that we can cover as many banks as we possibly can. But then what do we want to build on top of that? So when we think about AML compliance, if we think about things like cybersecurity, fraud detection, are those opportunities that we could have to connect the global banks for those transaction types? Could we start to correspond and communicate with one another with more data over the GPI network? I think those are some of the possibilities that are out there. Maybe ju just I'd like to, to have a discussion around speed because transparency, nobody will dispute the need for transparency. And indeed, when we talk to corporate treasurer, I mean, we, we interview around 700 corporate treasurer every year. Transparency it, it always comes first. On speed, we have typically very different responses. Our corporate treasurer say, no, please, you know, the, the world is uh, sufficiently complex. I prefer to process batch, and I'm completely fine as long as it's transparent to have these uh, payments uh, not being uh, posted immediately. Some others have a bit different view. I'd like to have a bit your view. Uh, I don't know, with Nigel, whether you, mm. you can start. I mean, Christian, is speed really something that is desirable? We know it's extremely expensive. <coughs> you can also argue that it is creating more risk because you know when a payment is processed immediately, if it's a fraudulent payment, it's mm. probably uh, an issue. So, so let, can down. we have a discussion <laughs> a bit about yeah. about the importance on speed? Of well, I think I think the importance of speed depends on the user and the expectations with uh, with whom you've set. Can I can I just if I just yeah. bear with me? Can the audience raise their hands if you live in a country that either has a real time 24 by 7 365 domestic clearing system or will have one? within the next five years? Show of hands? <laughs> OK, what do you think? 80%? Yeah. Let's just call it 80%. I expected that, by the way. Um, so we are telling our small businesses and our consumers in particular that real time is all about speed, fulfillment, and to a degree, data. Our corporate clients, as you allude, are, are less enthused for a variety of reasons. Um, but still, they can be significant beneficiaries. My question is around alternative models, right? And for the moment, if you'll just indulge me, I'm going to use a, an automotive analogy to talk about what we do today as correspondent bankers and what we might do in the future and the level of courage that we're showing around our current engine versus what our future engine might be. So if I use the analogy of the internal combustion engine, the ICE, and I can bear that to an electric vehicle, there's enough evidence in the market at the moment to suggest that we are happily on our way towards uh, having a completely EV economy globally in about five to ten years. All right, You can debate that, but in general, all new cars built by 2025 will be EVs. All right, So what I'm trying to do is draw an analogy between the internal combustion engine, our ICE. This is our current model. I was a big supporter of GPI and still am. But that's about making our ICE run faster, cleaner, more efficiently. It's not creating an EV, right? So my, my contention is, what is our EV? Now, our, our EV needs to be radically different. It needs to incorporate disruptive technology, much in the way the EV has. Tesla is very disruptive. Why? Because it has a battery whose cost is on an exponential downshift. It has 18 moving parts. An ICE car has 2,000 or more moving parts. I find that a very appropriate analogy. Correspondent banking is like the ICE with 2,000 moving parts. 
And if we're going to disrupt ourselves and change and give our customers the expectations which we're going to deliver to them <coughs> domestically over our real-time 24 by 7, 365 domestic clearing systems, we need to build an EV. But we need to understand what that looks like. And I don't think our current practices allow us to do that. And partly that is because we still believe passionately that we, are we have a framework that assumes we're, ex we're settling in physical cash. Mm -hmm. Still, that's the premise around clearing and settlement. So when you look at a cryptocurrency that has instant clearing and settlement, has no liquidity, but actually transfers value, it's a very interesting thing to think about. Now, Emma's boss doesn't like cri crypto cryptocurrencies very much. <laughs> yeah. No. Is that why you but put him right the next to me? Yeah, the problem I believe with the cryptocurrencies and all those kind of, because at the end of the day, every day, you, we see new uh, payment alternative and all those kind of things. Yeah. But the main problem is the adoption. It's like for yeah. a proof of concept, it's, it's really nice. It's because, for example, from IATA, we, uh, we had a proof of concept basically for, uh, for a blockchain, for utilizing blockchain and yep. cryptocurrencies. And even we are evaluating to create uh, our own uh, cryptocurrency for the, for the airline industry. However, for a proof of concept, it's fine because you are moving from a phone from one, from the point A and point sure. B and you are ticking the box. Yep. Fine. Sure. But the problem is with adoption. Of course. So the continuation of this thesis, and it is a thesis, is that the, any crypto coin that facilitates global trade and capital flows needs to be issued by a central bank or a bank at best. So it can then adopt the attributes that you need for transparency, compliance, uh, and visibility, and stability. So stability in the sense that the coin itself, which, which can move across a crypto or a, a blockchain um, network, is one-to-one -one with the fiat currency that has been issued against. You issue it into, into a wallet, your counterparty has a wallet on the other side of the world or wherever they may be, and that is also linked to a fully secured, fully compliant traditional bank account. But the transmission mechanism can eliminate clearing and settlement much in the same way as Bitcoin can not have a clear clearing and settlement differentiation and a liquidity to back it. Now, again, Bitcoin, as Emma reminded me just now, is kind of based on nothing, but it works. So if we put it up parameters around it that are supported by central fiat, supported by both the central bank and the, uh, the banks, the reputable banks that use it, and we f use the positive attributes of a crypto transfer, we've got something to think about. Maybe that's our EV. Maybe I can go to this car analogy that you built. Um, what about a hybrid? So I go yeah, back to... I agree. <laughs> Excellent. I, I go back to GPI. Um, and with GPI, you have got mm -hmm. the opportunity um, to send the payments via the SWIFT network and to use the new cloud-based tracker via an API, which we did as one of the very first banks um, using this. And I think that should be the starting point to say, look, it, GPI is the new normal. Um, it is live now. We have examples, payments from China to Australia via US dollar clearing. We, dut we just did one last week, 30 minutes end to end. Uh, with regard to uh, credit confirmed. If I look back two years when GPI was started, and I'm with you, it's just the start of a transformation, a big one. Um, would we have imagined that this Oops. is possible? Yes, we did, mm -hmm. yet we were not sure about network and reach. Yep. And what I want to say is ne network and reach, we absolutely can achieve with this. And in a manner that we are not just talking interbank stuff like how can we make correspondent bet banking better, um, the real story is about the end user, in this case, the corporate. Mm -hmm. And um, up to now, GPI has, have, has had no impact on corporates, yeah. only positive ones, mm -hmm. yeah, where, where it is already live. Like, you get the transparency um, with regard um, to where is the transaction. Um, banks can help you with tracking it. Um, you get charged transparency for interbank as well. I believe the next step is then to say, how, as a corporate, can you integrate this into your yeah. ERP systems yeah. and that is with, without making big investments so that we make life easier for you in this network um, of reach and global banks, regional banks, mid-tier banks that got to work together? And I believe that you have highlighted one of the most important uh, points in terms of, uh, and we cannot underestimate that part, 
because there are new technologies, but at the time that you try to integrate in your ERP system and in your processes, obviously it's quite in many, in many situations quite difficult and require a huge investment. At the end of the day, all the corporates are familiar with, uh, with SWIFT. Uh, many are uh, fully connected with all their, uh, their banks via SWIFT. And at the end of the day, it's something that, uh, from, a, from a corporate point of view, which I like it, and that is uh, my personal opinion, is we are talking always about disruptive technologies. But at the end of the day, here with GPI, it's, not, it's a technology that is existing for a while. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, all corporates are familiar with that, but only adding some small flavors and adjustments is going to bring an amazing benefit for, for yeah. the industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, by the way, that the hybrid is the most logical yeah. next step, right? But I, I do have a view that a hybrid is, is part an institutional corporate model and part a P2P or small business model, right? And it's the e-com clients who are going to push us there, right? Yes. Because yes. they're transiting <laughs> both. And if we can use GPI as an on-ramp and an off-ramp from traditional to new, you know, that's maybe how we live with the hybrid model. But I do agree with you, mm. though. We do, the view of de decentralized clearing and settlement will exist. I think our I, it, I think it works for some currencies and others. It's quite a far way out. But if we could link things together between the old and new and then integrate with the corporates in a way that you don't have to figure out what's happening globally, you can yeah. rely on your banks to do that for you. It should, yeah. We should be able to exist. Yeah, but uh, at the end of the day, the, the success of uh, GPI, and w one more time, and comparing with other alternative me uh, payment methods that we have right now in the, mm -hmm. in the ecosystem, is that uh, first of all uh, is to onboard as many uh, banks as possible. Its network is uh, is uh, important, and then uh, try to whatever we uh, implement is first of all bank agnostic from a corporate point of view. We hate and obviously because at the end of the day is, uh, there are huge investments required. It's basically to, to 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 create or to develop any kind of interface by bank. By bank. Uh, and, and think on, on the best way, obviously, to facilitate the integration or the implementation of these mm. new technologies for the corporates. Mm. And it looked much in the way that, that real-time domestic um, clearing systems set immediately consumer expectations yeah. and experiences. My, my contention is that this hybrid model needs to focus on, the, on that sector in terms of its new disruptive capability. Yeah. They are the customers that will leave us. Mm -hmm. They are the customers that have left us for alternative providers. So they're sending us a strong signal. The corporate treasurer is not leaving traditional banks. Mm -hmm. So they can tolerate uh, the internal combustion engine getting better. But our customers who are, hold bank accounts with us and have mortgages with us and want personal loans and corporate loans, small co corporate loans, they are leaving us every day uh. for other providers. Mm -hmm. And we're ignoring them. And that's where we need to be very disruptive. And that's why I think having that hybrid as I've it outlined it, where that community is served by a significantly different technology and a significantly different um, operational and uh, customer experience is something which is urgent. But, but Nigel, if we go back to this very interesting analogy about CAF, if we look to the Tesla, the, the value proposition is quite simple. Less pollution, supposedly driving you know, itself. Uh, so the, the, the value proposition is extremely simple. The solution that it's trying to solve is very simple. It's pollution, it's congestion, uh, etc. Now, here we're talking a lot about the solution, but what's the problem that we need to fix? Because we're talking about DLT and hybrid. Uh, the yeah. problem that Tesla is trying to fix is, is extremely clear. And when, when we talk to corporate treasurer, indeed, they, they say transparency, they also say simplicity. When you ask them what prevents you from sleeping at night, they say, Phew. he's still reconciling these payments. He's yep. still embedding uh, these payments in my, in my processes. And are we sure that these new models are really solving a problem, or are they a solution desperately looking no, for, I think for a problem? I, 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 or what's the problem that we need to solve? Right, the problem we're solving, what, what Tesla can and will increasingly do is give you Ferrari performance, mm -hmm for a Ford Fiesta price. We do not give that to our consumer, retail, and small business customers. We don't do that. And increasingly, the technology underpinning the EV, which again, I'm using as a, as a helpful analogy, is, is running down hard, right? So increasingly, 
the EV will be declining in cost and performance will be increasing range, etc. That's another analogy for saying, well, we've set the expectation domestically. What are you doing about that international component? How are you delivering your customers a, a typically less favoured con con uh, constituency compared to our corporate customers in terms of service, pricing and speed? How are we serving them and how much will they tolerate a new model that is radically different? And, and experience would, would tell me, given the participation in cryptocurrencies, like them or not, is that that's mainly individuals who want a better outcome. I mean, some of them are speculating, but it typically it's about a faster transmission mechanism at a price which they feel is fair. Yeah, so we, we got to discuss yeah. which market problem does correspondent yeah. banking solve today? Mm -hmm. And what do we need to do in order to respond to those market problems today and, and going forward. My understanding is there are different market problems in the market and they need to separate, each of them needs to be addressed with a, with, a, with a right solution. So my understanding is correspondent banking addresses the needs of exporters and importers that want to do international trade, global trade, uh, which have not been happy with uh, clarity on execution. By the way, correspondent banking can be very fast, but nobody knew it mm. because there was no confirmation end to end. The Benny Bank wouldn't know when the ordering bank has started this. Now, with GPI, um, this transparency comes. And, and, and there are more things to be built on. It is just the beginning. For the other market problems, maybe we need other solutions. Mm. Uh, yet, on the correspondent banking side, I think there is a huge obligation um, to do this well. And here, it's not only the end clients and the bank. The banks that are part of this, it's also the market infrastructures. Um, the central banks that operate real-time gross settlement systems. So whatever their plans are, that they are aligned with regard to new standards, new formats, how do we interact in this? And how we use those standards in order to also address uh, compliance and AFC questions. Like one question would be, should we integrate the legal entity identifier in this whole concept? Um, that is what we need to address in order to reduce um, the false positives in, in this model. And this, again, then, will support our, our exporters, our importers, our corporate clients. And I'm ab absolutely with Nigel, like, um, that new market problems have to be addressed in the right way. But let's solve the market problems for correspondent banking also in the right way and, and send the message like there are solutions in the marketplace which should be adopted in order to keep this business safe and sound yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and make it more attractive. And maybe one question around if we start again from some of the existing payments, pain points. And we, if we look at the, the, the second chart that I was showing where we see the South South Corridor growing very rapidly and we see the clearing, uh, the clearing centers not completely in line with you know, the, these trade flows. And when we talk in the industry, when we talk to some of these uh, market participants who, who are part of this South South Corridor and they say, but when I go to correspondent banking, I still need to clear through the U.S. because there is a U.S. transaction. You know, it goes through dollar, and then I'm subject to a very complex uh, sanction, uh, sanction environment, and that is it. That is very cumbersome for me, very difficult to navigate. How do you see the solution to that problem? Because I think that is a problem for some uh, uh, market participants, and that is one of the drivers for looking to alternatives. I don't know if, if one of you, or if, Emma, if you have a view being based in one of these big North clearing center. Sure, and I think, if I think about how, I, I'm, for US dollar transfers, we all have a bank obligation to assure um, our own regulatory compliance, and our obligation and what we're trying to do with our clients is make that simpler to, to comply. Mm -hmm. And so how do we communicate, format, talk to our clients about data that needs to transform, transfer with the transaction to be able to fulfill those client requirements. But if that's not sufficient, are there other solutions that you could devise or develop that would allow us to actually streamline those transactions and be able, be able to focus on timely settlement? So when I think about blockchain, rather than thinking about clearing and settlement, we're working on opportunities to exchange information. Yeah. Is there a way to, because correspondent banking works very much through a chain of banks, it's not usually just two participants, there's multiple participants, is there a way to leverage blockchain technology to short circuit that long communication chain and create a point-to-point -point 
mechanism for banks to correspond with one another to clear out those things that are, in many cases are false positives. Mm -hmm. And can we fulfill our regulatory obligations by asking through a blockchain for the pieces of information that we need to be able to quickly clear some of those compliance inquiries that we have mm. and then move on. And so I think when we think about correspondent banking, it's within our power to figure out how to make things more streamlined. But I'm with Christian, it, it, it's the system that works, it's the system that's safe, it's the system that's stable, but it shouldn't stay the same. There are new technologies that have presented themselves to actually address these old issues. GPI is one of them. Blockchain technology, being able to communicate point to point to our um, market correspondence in a, in a more effective way is now available because the technology is available. That's, that's how I think we're going to streamline and be able to enhance this experience. Very good. And how, maybe, maybe for you, uh, 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 Christian, how do you see new collaborations that need to happen in the industry to respond to these new developments? Because uh, uh, today we, we, we see um, we see players like Ripple that are a little bit outside, within and outside the system, uh, providing alternatives. Obviously, the, the, the banking system can use DLT, can create initiatives like GPI. So where do you see the next wave of collaboration? So what is it that the industry needs to put in its agenda to be part of this future, to, to, to be part of this new engine rather than letting you know, letting an alternative de de develop. Are there things that we need to collaborate in a different way? Or uh, how, how do you see this new type of collaborations to embrace these new technologies? My answer is we need to accept that this is a business which is in transformation. And we need to manage this transformation. And we need to do this in quicker time cycles than we've traditionally done. Yeah, and not to overstress GPI. GPI from launch of idea, which came through Nigel as a, as a major player in, in, in launching the idea two years ago, yeah, took exactly two years from being meaningful in practice. Will this be good enough for new sorts of cooperations going forward? Probably not. Not overstressing the release cycles of new software and, and disruptive solutions. Um, Two years is great in comparison to the past when it was said it takes 10 years to, to develop new schemes and, and bring them live and use them for 20, 30 years. Um, this has already been massively reduced, yet the industry needs to be more agile going forward. And as global transaction banks or correspondent banks, we need to be able to enable our clients to use this. Yeah, without going into, into specific solutions here, I think this enablement, this understanding, uh, could there be any impact on the, on the treasury side, and yeah. how, do we, how do we enable solutions there as well? If I, if I may, uh, again, is, I believe that if, if I can summarize from uh, the needs for a corporate is basically to have a payment alternative which is uh, faster, safer, and cheaper. And to be honest, that is something that I utilize from time to time. Is uh, right now we are in the digital Darwinism era, which at the end of the day, uh, the industry, and I'm talking about the banks, uh, and they need to uh, to have the same speed as the other players uh, that uh, we have in the payment ecosystem, if they want to survive. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the, the needs the needs of the corporates are clear. And, and, and somebody needs to, to satisfy. Obviously, I know, I know that there are many complexity I mentioned already in the beginning, security, cyber security, uh, even I know the complexity and, and the regulations that banks need to fulfill. But at the end of the day, is even the experience of our clients uh, has changed radically. Uh, we are talking before about the instant payments. At the end of the day, it's something that our customers are demanding, the instant payments. You ask the question. Everybody is right now, the trend is clear. The trend yeah. even, and I can, I can talk from a corporate point of view. Our processes, our internal processes in many corporates are not able right now, are not ready, are not prepared for managing instant payments. Yeah. However, uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the customers has the reason. Is, uh, there is no more options than basically uh, final solutions to the, to the customers because otherwise perhaps tomorrow you will, you will not be in the market. Yeah. I, th I think the risk is that we get the emergence of a non-bank player that gets uh, credibility and a reputation to, for doing the right things 
and becomes popular politically, popular with the community, um, and um, can gain traction. Um, now, I'm not saying my analogy to this ticks all those boxes, but if you just look at what's going on with domestic payments in China, domestic payments in China are dominated by two big companies. And they're both technology companies, Tencent and Alibaba, mm. right? And that, to me, is a cautionary tale that says, if you ignore this constituency and don't give them the service that, you've, that they become to expect because of observing other digital offerings, it is possible for significant networks and ecosystems to evolve outside of the banking system or around the banking system that are superior and will, for the long term, potentially disintermediate you totally. And I think that's just what we have to remind ourselves of, that this, this is in evidence in one of the largest countries in the world. And you think about the number of uh, customers these companies have they would be, uh, you know, we, we, we dream of having this 800 million, 600 million users per day uh, because they've built an ecosystem around a payment technology, which is pretty rudimentary, but it works and people like it and it's become credible and accepted. Uh, absolutely. It's quite interesting because when you talk about these new uh, entrants and when we, 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 we talk again to corporate uh, a treasure around the banking system, they still have an enormous amount of trust in the system. Hmm. And it's a system that is and that is still seen as highly, highly reliable. And I think it's also an asset that the banking industry has and that is probably not always fully uh, leveraging. And maybe one of the questions for the industry is how can you leverage this unique asset which is, which is trust? Because today maybe it's not fully transparent, maybe it's not uh, cheap, maybe it's, it's a little bit slow, but the payment goes through and, and the money does not get lost. There are no leakages in the pipe, so it's not like you know uh, there is uh, money flowing around like in some old uh, water utility system. And I think that is probably something that, um, as a banking community, you, know, you need to think around how to really monetize uh, this trust. And you're, you're very right that mm. it could be actually also quite, um, quite dangerous for less regulated system to gain a position to create trust while the relative bit less, less, less robust. And that's going to be a very interesting, I think, also discussion for the re regulator. It's something they need to think about, about the extent to which there are low competition from uh, players that are less regulated, that are less resilient and reliable. That's going to be a very mm. interesting. Uh, mm. But I think you're trying to stress, though, that we all need to address this for our underlying clients. But we're here at SWIFT and it's a, at Cybos, and it's a perfect opportunity for the banks to work with the other banks to be able to do that. So thinking of a couple of ways, are there particular corridors? You showed the corridors. Are there particular corridors that banks should be thinking about to help revolutionize that experience, make it more instantaneous for their underlying client base? Is that an opportunity for the banks to work with one another? Maybe it's those opportunities for us mm -hmm. to come together as a global community to think about it, not just locally. I know in the US, uh, with the RTP coming uh, later this year, we're working through the clearinghouse, so that's the banks mm -hmm. collaborating on a solution for the real-time payment networks, and frankly, the solution was favored by the regulators. A bank solution was favored by the regulators. So I'm thinking of more of those opportunities if we as can come together as a community to do those, to make that global connectivity so a FinTech or a non-bank doesn't rise up to say, oh, well, we can solve that problem for you. You know, maybe the, those are some of the incremental steps that we could yeah, take. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I, I think, as I said, the reason I asked the, yeah. the audience was to demonstrate the emergence, the rapid emergence sure of these real-time clearing systems, and as you rightly suggest, Emma, the connection between, between them. Uh, these two, uh, two countries or multilateral um, uh, connection, however that is done, uh, I'm not gonna propose the technology, but there are some that would be able to do that very well. Um, that is potentially your, your EV, right? You're yep. very close to that experience. And it all comes down to the promise that you give your client. If your small business or your um, consumer client is experiencing a near real-time execution through traditional rails, they don't care. They don't wake up in the morning and say, I really want correspondent banking today, mm -hmm. so any more than they go to a, a dealership and say, I want to buy an internal combustion car. Yeah. They want a mobility service or they want a transactional payment service. So they don't prescribe the technology, but they prescribe the experience. Which was your point. Thank you. Yeah. We have around uh, 15 minutes left, so I, I suggest we open it up to uh, 
to questions. So if we can turn the light on there, uh, two people with microphones. So why don't we, why don't we open it up to, to, to questions? So I don't know who, who wants to start uh, to raise questions. There's a question there. Thank you, guys. This is a, a great topic, and I think everybody is, at least over the past few years, been thinking about this quite a lot. And I forget which one of you said it, but you said if a bank doesn't, or the banks together don't come out and solve this, some fintech, fintech company will come out and do it. Uh, that fintech company would be someone like me, <laughs> um, because we're looking at this problem, and we say, oh, cool, we can build all these things, and the solutions are so obvious. But I think that the role of the banks need to be to support those companies almost in the form of like a venture capitalist. Get involved early and then you get the rewards at the end. And I think that there needs to be this sort of realization and uh, some, some banks already have and that's that these services of basically providing corridors but also liquidity is becoming a commodity and that business is going to disappear because the, the corridors aren't going to be needed in a distributive system, and the settlement is just going to happen through either blockchain or uh, just DLTs, mm -hmm. and the liquidity is going to be through, uh, I think Nigel mentioned, a, a universal currency. If that has trading pairs with all the other currencies, it makes sense to hold that, and then the, all, all the, uh, the Nostra Vostra accounts don't need to hold as much, and everybody just trades on that. Mm -hmm. So I think if you have all that in mind, is that's the future, then the question is, what can these banks offer as value? And I think if, you know, in, in the system you said trust, and I thought trust, okay, that, that's actually a really good one. You have that in the short term. But uh, zero counterparty risk and instant settlement removes a lot of the need to even have trust in the first place. So I think that the, the challenge is how do you get on board with, these, with this change and have an active part in, in getting a part of the ecosystem hmm. as it's happening? And then two, what other services can you build on top? So if it's a protocol like a DLT, like what API layer stuff and applications can then maybe the bank zone. So it's like, can you build a payment system like in China where Visa isn't needed and all the ISOs and card issuers aren't needed anymore? And I think that's, the banks actually can take a hold of that as a business hmm. once these technologies come to, come to life. Um, I mean, if you see any issues of Question. those things, I'd love to hear comments and hmm. just sort of that, that line of thinking. Um, I, I share your vision. Um, as a provocative uh, um, member of the panel. Um, but what the banks offer is regulation. Yeah. Not because they want it, but because their customers implicitly want it. And that generates trust, transparency, accountability. And I think you're right to suggest that the combination of smart fintechs like yourselves and banks who are regulated entities in which, uh, like it or not, the public has trust because of that regulatory framework and that transparency and compliance that we're obligated to achieve. That is a nice, a nice mix, and I don't see why that couldn't work. Yeah, and, and I believe that obviously we haven't discussed, uh, we haven't tackled today, but uh, an important player basically in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, situation, or in this uh, ecosystem, is the, the role that the regulators and the governments are playing. Yep. Uh, and I would like to add the point um, how to ensure the network and the reach. Um, mm. It can disrupt the market if a player can connect to another player, say, in a, in a destination country. The current model works that way um, through trust, but trust wasn't enough. So the baseline security controls are just being implemented with the customer security program um, of SWIFT, which is, which is massive. So to, to also uh, back the trust um, in the system. It's also with regard to which counterparty can I trust on the SWIFT network, which goes to the key exchange, to the RMAs. Um, so the question is, how can alternatives achieve the same reachability for our corporate clients, um, which happen to send or receive their payments from all over the world, um, and who want us just not to connect with a single bank in country X, Y, or Z, but ensure overall reachability within that country. Yeah. Mm. And that has been achieved through this model. 
obviously with a lot of transparency towards the regulators. Um, and the question is, how can this customer experience uh, that you have the reachability be also put into a future model? Very good. Mm. Other, other questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is about your hybrid model. A uh, hybrid model, sorry. Uh, and how, how do you look at the one of the other pain points in correspondent banking is the post-validation. So we have a lot of things falling on the floor as a part of maybe incomplete uh, information provided. How can your hybrid model solve some of that pre-validation uh, to ensure that we do have timeliness and accurate information coming mm. across? Well, it's fair to say I haven't written all the specifications for the hybrid model, and probably the gentleman in the corner there probably has. But model. <laughs> yeah, or maybe Chris, Chris has. But look, I, I think that that is clearly one of the requirements. And so um, I, I have a, um, a view that um, uh, you, know, you, you, you have a, a traditional bank account which, which is able to buy uh, or, or associate itself with a wallet, and that wallet is able to purchase uh, on the basis of the fiat back bank account a, a crypto coin. Um, now, the other um, idea that you would have around that wallet is that it is um, fully pre-cleared, sanction-checked, uh, and, in, and, and in real time. It's, it's constantly being screen-checked. And so it is associated with an individual, an account that is known and checked. Um, the, in, the payment instructions need only be the, the address of the other wallet. Now, again, we've got to get our head around that. Is that enough? I don't know. But if it's associated irrevocably with the fully kyc transparent bank account, which is uh, meeting regulatory requirements, I would, I would contest that you've met that, that standard. I would like to add one basic point to this. Um, the new model of tracing with the tracker in the cloud by Swift should do away with something like 50% of investigations right away. So, of course, there are these forward-looking solutions which need to be discussed. Yet, maybe you agree with me that many investigations are about, has the money arrived? <laughs> and you need it to go through the chain sequentially. Yeah. Painful, takes days. Now, with that tracker solution, which is live, um, all of this should disappear. 50%. 50% of your inquiries yeah. done. Yeah, 50% of the inquiries are done. done. So mm -hmm. whilst we have to be forward-looking, we've got to treat this as a new, new normal and simply apply it, because it's available. A question there? We have two questions, so I guess right and left in your sense. Okay. Just want an optimistic note to the, in favor of the banks. I think a big advantage that the banks have is that they have the clients. I mean, all the fintech and the new systems and the disruptive people, they have to go and find the client base. But the banks already have the clients. If you look at the UK, for example, there are four or five banks that have a huge majority of all the banking clients in the UK. So it's up to them to create a system by which if John in London send, wants to send to Peter in Birmingham 15 pounds or 15,000 pounds, he should be able to do it as simple as possible. All these clients hopefully are KYC checked they are all approved by the banking system. They are all absolutely legitimate. So any payment should be able to be done very quickly. And I'm, I'm just puzzled by the fact why, if the banks own the clients, which are all cleared, why would they allow somebody within a country, admittedly not cross-border, yep. why would they allow somebody like Google or Facebook or somebody else coming back and take this payment system from them, <laughs> from people who don't have these clients? Right. I think the mistake we make as banks is we think we um, own the client. Not all that, banks, though. <laughs> no, if, but I, but I, I fundamentally have, a, have, a, have a, a real objection to us as bankers thinking we own the client. I think that is nonsense. We, we facilitate services for them. And then in China, 800 million people chose to use WeChat Pay or Alipay. Yeah. Who owns the client there? You know, we own a bank account, we give them a service, but this ownership of the client thing is a very, very, very febrile right. concept. But I, but I think the point you're trying to make, though, is there isn't any reason why the pan bank can't innovate, because we do have both relationships. So, who, you know, we may not own them, but we do have a relationship with someone on either end. And all I'm trying to say is the yeah. banks can innovate, too. We don't have to have a fintech. We can maybe invent this oh, I don't technology and solution I'm just, ourselves. I'm just giving you data points yeah. where, where sure. banks have not 
um, um, okay. realise the potential of that presumed customer ownership. But I think the call to action is to, is to address the pain points, work as we can in the now, the here and now, yeah. which I think the point is, is that GPI addresses a lot of the here and now issues while we work together on, yeah. on your future state vision, which I think is closer in some jurisdictions than others, but it isn't you know, necessarily up to another company to do that for us. I guess the, the point we're trying to make is we can do this together, We have an right? opportunity. I yeah, and we can, we can still call it correspondent banking if we invent it, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got to rename it. <laughs> there, was a, yeah, there was a question there. Yes, I, th I thought the debate was very interesting, and I like the analogy around the inter internal combustion engine versus the electronic uh, or the electrical vehicle. Um, but I, I thought about this uh, a bit before, and... I think maybe the electrical vehicle has reached a tipping point, which I'm not sure that we have in the case of correspondent banking. Um, and you know, it, it, that's reached a tipping point after you know 100 years of, of evolution. So I'm wondering whether there's still a long way to go before the evolution of correspondent banking, which GPI, I think, is a great move forward, um, gives it a long lease of life. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of the distributed technology and blockchain, et cetera, hasn't taken off at the speed at which people thought it would. Because the pressure to change is not as great as people think. You need a burning platform to make a transformative change. Mm. I don't think we have that. I think GPI gives a lot of lease of life to correspondent banking. Second point was, I wonder whether we left out one of the biggest, uh, maybe the elephant in the room. Um, transparency, et cetera, is all very nice. Um, I think the biggest problem that we have at the moment in correspondent banking is the shrinkage of the correspondent banking network. Um, and large sections of the world and countries which are being denied access to international payment and financing facilities. Mm -hmm. That, I think, actually is a bigger problem than the problems that we've talked about. And I'd be very interested to see how we tackle those issues whilst carrying on with the good efficiencies that come from GPI, which I think is great. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure that's actually the biggest problem that the corporate world or the global economy faces today. Maybe I, I try to answer for, or make a comment, because yours was a comment. I would like to comment back and say, um, yes, while GPI is, is great to address the current correspondent banking, as banks we should always we should also think about which part of the market are we not addressing, which will go international yeah. and will have other requirements um, which are not met by the current correspondent banking model. Mm. Yeah, so where, where would we lose like capturing market share where the traditional correspondent banking now transformed by GPI, even after GPI transformation, yeah. could not access those payments? And I think we should be a little bit more forward-looking in that regard, and also hungry for success. No. And I would also comment that um, many industries historically have shown that um, thinking they have more time than they do is their death knell. Yeah. Uh, because the S-curve for disruptive technology is, is, repeats itself over and over and over again. And it's those industries that misdefine their, their purpose and their timing that, that lose. And, and the second point about this debanking or down, downstreaming that you mentioned, I think it's a really, really interesting point, and it's been driven by a number of forces that I think we all understand within the room. But that also then opens the door for alternative non-bank networks to blossom. I mean, you only have to look at, um, I don't know how old M-Pesa is in Tanzania and Kenya, but it's been there for 15 years, 20 years, I don't know. That was a gap in the market. And some very smart people brought a product to market that fulfilled a gap an unbanked gap. Um, and so what we're doing potentially is by, by debank, debanking is, and downstreaming is creating an even bigger community of unbanked or un, uh, you know, un, unserved um, constituencies who will then go and find alternatives that will disrupt, is my opinion. Yep. <laughs> Any final comment? I think it's almost time for many of you to go to cocktails, etc. So uh, we're reaching, <laughs> it's almost 5 p.m. today, but. Uh, one of you having a final comment to close? Very good. Thank you. But first, thank you very much to the panelists. I think it was a, it was a, a great panel. Thank you for the audience for the question. <laughs> <laughs>